Gracious Heavenly Father, I come into your presence once again just so thankful for the opportunity that we have to just feast upon your word. I ask that you would filter out all of the nonsense, all of, all of that which is not of you, and just seal to our hearts the truth of your word that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the book of Revelation. We just started it, uh, uh, I believe, just a few days ago, and we're right in the middle of an election. And uh, I am absolutely positive that God has determined the outcome of it. So we're going to continue on in this most, uh, and I, I can't even think of the word. I, how, how do you describe the book of Revelation? I think there are many who believe that we're now studying uh, the book of Revelation, so we're going to know all that it means. And I don't want to disappoint you folks, but that's not going to be the case. This book has no doubt produced millions of, of debates and arguments and different viewpoints and folks I want to be very careful I don't want to pick on people who disagree with me I don't want y'all being mad at me because I don't believe what you believe uh, we can disagree on what I think these verses might mean and we can stay friends and I, I want to I want what we do here to be done in love I can point to out four or five ways that you can approach the book but only two of those, in my mind, are what we uh, are, uh, are. They're what I would call conservative theology, uh, and the uh, preterism uh, being one, and the other dispensationalism or futurism, which is my view, more the more conservative view. And as we go through this study, I'd like to avoid trying to tell you that you know, well, this is exactly what this means. You know, be, to be dogmatic about certain things. Now, if you think that you're going to walk away from here and know exactly what all of this, all of this scripture means, I mean, you're just going to be sorely disappointed. But I will try and present it the best that I can, looking at the text, strictly looking at the text, as we've done in every one of our uh, previous Bible studies, verse-by-verse -verse studies. Now, as I pointed out last week, the text says it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's an objective genitive. It's Christ's revelation. I read in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 6, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you come behind in no gift waiting for the coming, the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Same construction, same thing that you have here in the book of Revelation. Same phrase, uh, exactly, precisely the same construction, sentence construction. Uh, in 1 Peter 1.13, Wherefore, gird up your loins, the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Same phrase. And that's what we're looking forward to. So what we've been told to look forward to and what we were told in Titus, we were told this same, we see the same thing in Titus, that we are looking for the appearing of the great God, even our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what we have right here. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. I find that interesting. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ that both Paul and Corinthians, through the leading of the Holy Spirit, and Peter in his epistle, through the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's what they've said. That's what we're looking forward to. So this book 
is Jesus Christ, his revelation. And that's our blessed hope. So this was given by God to Jesus Christ. We have Jesus Christ and we have uh, God here. And we see, we'll, we see his deity through this study to, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his messenger or his angel unto his servant, John. Well, he doesn't call us servants. We serve God, but he doesn't call us servants. He calls us sons. And we're going to find as we go through this book that there's a tremendous amount of Old Testament references as I pointed out in the introduction. And it would be a very easy thing to say that this is a Jewish book. And that statement has been made by many others who have spent years studying this book far more, many more years than I have. And I have to agree that there's a lot of it that's in this book that's Jewish in character. You, you can't not see that. There's over 400 Old Testament references in 22 chapters. That's 20 per chapter. In the uh, very first verse, we're told that this book is essentially for Israel or the Jew. And he's going to show them in the revelation of Jesus Christ, those things which are quickly going to come to pass. I believe that we are from the very beginning of, of, the, of our study here, the very outset, we're looking at ourselves being gone. Now that's the view that I hold. And now something is going to happen quickly. And whenever it starts, it's going to happen in a hurry. Uh, it must happen. We see it's the Greek word D or die. It's, what, it's what's called the must of necessity, just like you must be born again, not the must of obligation, uh, you know, such as I, I must pay my taxes. It has to happen because God has decreed it in other words, the very first verse impresses upon us the fact that whatever we're, we're going to read in the rest of this book is certain. It's been decreed by God. It's been determined by God. It has to happen. It must happen. And it must happen quickly. Meaning that, that whenever God decides this starts, it's, it's going to, to end in a hurry. And I recognize the word angel means a messenger, which is used for, uh, you'll see it used in Hebrews of, of human messengers, I believe. You see it used of both celestial or human messengers. And, and, and some say that the, the angel here is, is Michael, you know, because Michael stands for the Jewish people. And maybe that's who it is. You know, he's not named. The Holy Spirit was silent about the identity of the angel. I mentioned how I thought it could be someone that John would have recognized, such as Peter, for example. you got to remember that, uh, well, without getting into the time versus eternity thing, I don't, I don't believe that we can say with certainty who it is. And it, it is John who, who bore, that's an aorist tense, record of the Word of God, which I believe the aorist says that that's what he did in his life. He brought a record of the Word of God. This is God's Word. This book of Revelation along with the rest of Scripture is God's Word. That's what this book is. It's the record of God's Word in the testimony of Jesus Christ and the things that were revealed to John. So it could be impressing uh, on us that the fact that the one God is using uh, to write this book, John, you know, is in fact John, who at that time bore witness of Jesus Christ. Blessed are they who read, hear, and keep the words of this prophecy. Uh, 
Blessed, that's a word that means fortunate. The Greek word there for read is to read aloud. And it's a present tense. There, there wasn't a single one of those churches that could, that could, you know, just hand that epistle, you know, off to somebody and say, you know, just, you know, could you make me a bunch of Xerox copies, you know, so everybody there could have it. So, you know, we got a guy that reads, and he'd read aloud when the epistle came to the church. We're told that that whatever we're reading in, in the rest of this book is a prophecy. And we'll have to decide as we go along whether any, all, or some of it's been fulfilled. As I pointed out, the preterist view believes it's all, for the most part, been fulfilled. But when he wrote it, in, in the sense of verse 3, it was a prophecy. They probably only had one copy per church. That's That would be my my guess uh, I doubt John sent more than one copy to each church you know he was told to send seven letters you know maybe he uh, maybe he copied that seven times you know how he did that that's up to you but apparently seven letters were sent or maybe one letter was sent to Ephesus and then was it was transferred to the next church and then to the next church and you know they just passed it along you know maybe this this thing was just one letter transferred among the seven churches I don't know I don't know but whatever it was when he wrote it it was prophecy and and we're gonna look at at that as we go along but not only are they fortunate if they hear it, they read it and hear it, but if they guard it, the word is keep, the word, the word keep there means guard. And it's, and it's a plural word. That means they guarded those things which were written. Now, uh, now that's an interesting Greek expression because it's a perfect passive it is exactly the expression used of the other scripture. And, uh, you know, most people have disagreed with me on this, so join the crowd. But my personal opinion, and, and yeah, I hate, I really hate. Well, my personal opinion is, is that this is a, a tacit testimony by the Holy Spirit that the book of Revelation is as much scripture as Genesis is. Perfect passive in the Greek. Those things which have been written. And you could say, you could say that's, that's only the book of Revelation. If it's only the book of Revelation, then, then, then one has to wonder why it's a perfect passive. But it could possibly mean that uh, this is only a reference to the book of Revelation. I think it's a reference to the fact that this book is, is included in, in uh, the Holy Scripture. It's, it's, it's as much Scripture as the writings of Paul or the writings of, of Moses. Why? Well, because the time is at hand. And the word time is, is kairos. It's not chronos. There's two words for time. It's not chronos, the idea of, of chronological, you know, the idea of running time. It's, it's, it's a time of an appointed time. It's, it's a, a decreed time. So the, the content of this book is dealing with a time that God decreed. And what we're seeing in this book is the, is the time of that prophecy decreed by God. What I'm saying here is that I believe this book deals with that decreed time of, of God's dealing with Israel and the, and the inhabitants of the earth. That's what I believe. 
And John was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. I mentioned in the introduction how it's not Sunday or the Sabbath, Sunday or Saturday or whenever you think the Sabbath is. That's not the, the, the expression, but that it's a special day of the Lord. It's a very particular day. That it's the day of the Lord, a very particular phrase, as the Old Testament says, a very specific time in human history beginning after the body of Christ has been removed. And it's referred to over and over and over again in the Old Testament. That's what I think it's saying. That John was in the, in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And that's future. That's yet future for us. And I think that is the basis for what John is about to say to the seven churches. And now it's interesting that in Acts chapter 7, we're told that Moses was in the church in the wilderness. Okay, same word. So once again, it appears uh, Jewish in character. And, and, and folks, we can argue all day long about the meaning of the word church here. You know, means congregation, assembly. You know, by referring to the church beginning in Acts, you know, so the church, that's got to be us. But Moses was in the church that was in the wilderness. Same word for church in the Greek. So, there are those who say that these churches represent the condition of the nation Israel after the rapture of the church. You know, the church as we know it today the body of Christ. You know, they represent the condition of, of the nation Israel as God returns to deal with that nation. That's, that's one suggestion. The number seven is, is used repeatedly in God's Word. Don't even get me started about sevens. You know, in fact, it is so important, that sacred number seven, you know, that we have seven days in a week, as well as many other things. I think... The reason there are seven churches, not five or six or eight or nine or whatever, is because seven is God's number for completeness. And, and, and we have a lot of sevens in this book, as you, as you already know. So obviously there's something in the number seven that's important to God, just as, as is the case with the number 40 or 70 or... 120 or you know many other numbers it could be that seven churches means that's the message to the complete church okay the question is what does it mean by church and i have little doubt that the majority position on that is that these are actual churches of christian believers in our present age the age of grace but there's another possibility that I'd like for you to think about. And that's that the seven churches represent the condition of Israel when God begins to deal with Israel again. When he, the church is gone and He turns His attention back to Israel. There are others that say that the seven churches represent the history of the church. Uh, you know, that, that view, that was popularized in a great way by Schofield. And so... The seven churches represent seven periods of church history. Many of you may have heard of that. Many of you may hold to that view. It's, the, it's a popular view. It wouldn't be the position that I'd take. You really have to push it to say that these churches actually represent those periods of history. Uh, I think there have been those in every generation my parents, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, your great-great-grandparents, you know, that felt that they were the, 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 they were the church of Laodicea. Okay, so you have to really push that idea to make that fit. You know, I can point to an article written in 1844 where that they thought that they were the church of Laodicea. You know, saying about essentially the same thing that I hear Christians saying about Laodicea today. I do believe that there's been, there has been uh, in my lifetime and in your lifetime, 
a departure from doctrinal truth, but that's always been true. I think it's a little worse today than, than ever, but it was true in Calvin's day, it was true in Luther's day. You know, uh, whether that departure is greater today than it, than it ever has been is something that you have to decide for yourself. I think many of you know what I think. I think you know what my position on that is. Uh, you know, it really has changed. You look for a church that, that, that is serious about Bible doctrine today and the sovereignty of God, and they're hard to find. And perhaps that's always been the case, but there is, uh, there is the position, uh, and it seems to be the majority one, that these seven churches represent seven periods of church history until Christ comes. Now, a, uh, another possibility is that these seven churches represent the condition of the church at the rapture as well as uh, tribulation period saints when Christ comes. Since there's really not any uh, real space of time in between. Now, that's my opinion for what it's worth. And folks, I am uh, absolutely thrilled that you have the Holy Spirit to, to guide you, to lead you, to aid you in your study of this book, the same as I do. I, uh, I do know that for the last three or 400 years, probably more than that, every Bible student at that time thought he was in Laodicea. You know, so there hasn't been anything, you know, like general agreement on these churches representing the, the history of the Christian church. And I think it's more likely that uh, they represent the condition of God's elect following the rapture. The word church simply means congregation or assembly. It does not say letters to uh, the seven bodies of Christ. Okay? At these locations. There are those who believe that it is characteristic of the church in any age, you know, no matter what time in history, no matter what time you're looking at, that these seven letters represent the condition of the Christian church. Now, uh, I, I just I don't think it, folks that it's worth arguing about to the point of, of division okay uh, the word and there in our text too as we look at all the ands in the following or it is a grammatical technique that's used in the Greek that stresses emphasis okay and and it's very apparent in this chapter Okay, it's an emphasis that recognizes a whole, just a whale of a lot of conjunctions. You know, looking at the fourth verse, verse four, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now, now, normally, you know, I mean, we would use commas in the English language, but you see the Holy Spirit here is emphasizing each one of those segments there, separated by ands, as an individual thought. Christ is the eternal God, which is and which was and which is to come. And the Holy Spirit is expecting us to look at each one of those. He's the eternal God. He's the, he's the God who spoke the worlds into existence. You know, he was in the beginning. 
you know, the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He's the coming one. You know, every aspect of our thought is about this person, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the eternal God, and He's coming again. Just what we would expect those who are those who are here after we are gone would need to hear. Okay? But I am in no way suggesting that, that we can just, you know, dis disassociate ourselves from that verse. He's going to return. You know, we don't serve a dead Savior. We don't have a crucifix with a, with a body on the cross. Our Lord has risen from the dead. He's alive and He's coming again. He's, he has, he's not neglected us. Folks, He hasn't neglected you. He hasn't forgotten about you. He hasn't deserted you. He's working in you both the will and to do of His good pleasure. Our hope is in the Lord. But so is theirs. This, this one who is coming again, and He is Jesus Christ, Okay, I'm, I, I'll say it again, folks. I'm seeing ourselves here, okay, as gone, okay? Our Lord is their Lord. You know, He was born in a manger. He died on the cross. He rose again, and He's the promised Messiah who, who is the faithful witness. There's no greater message for these people after we're gone. We saw in Romans chapter 3, but now the righteousness of God is witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. You remember that? When we studied through that, that wonderful book? If He hadn't been faithful, we, we wouldn't have had any hope. He was that faithful witness. He's the one that witnessed to the truth of God's law, to the, to the penalty of God's law, to the results of sin and the redemption that's in Christ. Now, I think we're gone. At least up to this point in our study, we are not in the picture. We're gone. We've already left. It's because He died that we live. It's because He died that, that they will live. Okay? Because we are His. Because He chose us. Because we are His children. He's the faithful witness. There's application there for us as well. And He's the first begotten from the dead. He's the first one to rise from the dead who, who didn't die. There were, I mean, there were, there, were, there were resurrections from the dead, but those people died again. He's the, uh, he's the prince of the kings of the earth. He's the one that rules. It's a, it's a present tense. He's presently ruling. We've been washed. The word in the Greek is there is loosed, believe it or not. And I think both concepts are true. You Greek students, take a look at the word. It's, it's loosed. The Lord Jesus Christ loosed us from sin by his blood my, my problem over the years in talking with Christians is is most of them don't seem to comprehend that God has loosed us from all our sin or that they've been washed from all their sin you know when he says that he forgave us all our sin did he do you think he lied you have one verse of Scripture in the, in the context of fellowship. The, the context is fellowship. Saying that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive, forgive us of our sin. It has to do with our fellowship with Him, our walk. When in, Fe, in, in Ephesians, he, forg he forgave you of all sin. And in Colossians, He forgave you of all trespasses. And fewer and fewer Christians seem to care about those verses. Oh, they, they know 1 John 1, 9, but they, see, they don't seem to, to care about these other verses. 
But see, I'm not supposed to tell y'all that, okay? Because if I do, then we run the risk that most of you are just going to go run out and say, well, that's, that's, a, that's great news. That's absolutely fabulous news, okay? We can now just sin all we want. And it doesn't make any difference because it, it's all forgiven. Well, the truth of the matter is, folks, it is. What is not true is that it doesn't make any difference. Oh, it doesn't make any difference in the, in the, in the, in the payment that Christ made. Not in the truth that you're fully, completely, totally forgiven. But in your relationship and your walk with Him, with Him, it does make a difference. My personal opinion is that if you know the Lord and you love Him, there, isn't a, there is not a single one of you who wants to go out and sin all that you want. You know, I'm already sinning more than what I want. Of course, you do sin to be sure, but you don't want to. But if any of you are, are out there are trying not to sin and trying to live a good life because you think that's something that you've got to do, I feel sorry for you. I do. I feel sorry for you. But if you're trying to live for Him because you love Him, that's wonderful. The expression in His blood means substitutionary in our place and hath made us kings and priests unto God and His Father. Now, okay, well, the problem with that is that it's a direct quote from Exodus 19.6. And it's one of the reasons that uh, people have suggested that we're looking here, what we're looking at here is uh, we're looking at a Jewish church because to suggest that we are kings and priests, you know, really... Uh, it should have been based on it, or First Peter or Second Peter, which you know the Holy Spirit could have mentioned here, okay, but he doesn't. You know, it seems to be more a, 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 a Jewish expression than it does a church expression, and so there are those who say, you know, that this does not apply to members of the body of Christ, but to the nation Israel. Folks, I, I, I just need to, to, I need you to think about all these different views. I, I, do, I do believe there's an application for us as members of the body of Christ, just as there are many truths for Israel for which we make application. Kind of goes both ways. You know, such as he was wounded for our transgressions. Well, the, clearly the context is Israel, but he, do you follow what I'm saying? Yet, it still has application to us. What Jesus Christ did was place us in His kingdom. And Him be glory, dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, there's two words as, as far as I know. They're, they're very, those very common in any known language, at least in every known modern language. There's two words that are really common, and that's amen and hallelujah. You know, that's, those are words both the church and Israel would understand. You know, I remember hearing back in, in, uh, in my Bible college days how uh, about a Bible conference where the, 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 somebody was holding a Bible conference, and they had, they, had, they had assigned two people to each hotel room. And... Uh, and two people that was chosen off the list of the attendees wound up in a motel room. And one of them spoke Chinese, I believe, and, and the other spoke Russian. And they couldn't begin to understand each other. And they, they looked at each other for a few moments. And one of them said, Amen. And the other one said, Hallelujah. So each of these separated by the conjunction and 
is a wonderful truth that needs to be emphasized. Verse 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. And once again, folks, once again, many take this as evidence that this is the Jewish church. I mean, clearly that is not a reference to the rapture. And most of you know that I'm pre-trib. Uh, you may have stumbled on this video and not be pre-trib. It's possible that every eye will see him. There is a reference to, uh, from Zechariah, which are, in which are pierced is a reference from Zechariah. The other is Daniel chapter 7. They wail because of him. I mean, folks, that clearly, that is clearly our Lord's second coming, without a doubt. Okay? And you know, there's there's just there are there are just great numbers of people who say, well, yes, okay, yeah, all that's true, you know, except there's only one coming. You know, and the reference in First Thessalonians chapter four is is the same coming that's in uh, it's that's in First Corinthians chapter fifteen and Revelation chapter one. You know, where we're at right here, uh, verse seven and. And, and then later on in the 19th chapter, you know, it's all just one, one coming. And, and folks, I can't settle that question for you. I can simply tell you that when I look at all the evidence and I've spent 40 years doing it, I do, I do believe that there is a removal of the body of Christ and that there is a return of Christ in glory to establish rule and reign over the earth. He already rules and reigns over the earth, but there's a time in which he will return and rule bodily after the second coming or at the second coming. And his, his reign will be over people that who, if you cut them, they'll bleed. They're, they're not a, a raptured, glorified body type people. That means that verse 7 then refers to a coming in glory and judgment, not to a removal of the body of Christ. And to me, it only makes sense that that, that that statement is made here to the letter to the churches if the rapture has already occurred. If what we are looking at is the church, after the rapture, which would, would make it essentially Jewish in a sense, then there's no problem with verse 7, you know, to one that believes that there are, are two comings. But if you don't believe, if you do not believe that there are two comings, well, then there's no problem at all with verse 7, you know. I mean, you can place the church any place that you want. I think you know, most of you, at least most of you do, you know what I believe. And so I just ask you to think about it. I ask you to think about these things. A kingdom of priests, that's, that's a clear, clear reference to Exodus chapter 19. You know, and as I pointed out, there's, there are over 400 Old Testament references in 22 chapters. That's almost... Uh, 20 a chapter, I believe. And we've had 10 so far in this chapter. If that's a reference to a Jewish church and this coming is after the rapture, then all of that fits. I don't know why Christians would, would insist upon being here, right? you know, if the text seems to indicate that we're not. And I know that there's, there's got to be somebody sitting out there saying, well, tell us which one it is. I think you know what I think, folks. I think you know what I think. And, but you have to decide that for yourself. I am Alpha and Omega. There's no and in between Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end in the original text. We see, we see that so the two thoughts are connected. 
you know, uh, in Genesis we see the fall of man, and in Revelation we see man risen. You know, in Genesis we see the the entrance of sin. In Revelation we see the doing away with sin, and you you can go on and on and on. I think about uh, forty some odd corollaries have been made between the Revelation that completes the story that began in the book of Genesis. We have the expression, the Almighty God. Almighty. He's the God that, that thundered the law from Mount Sinai. He's the God that spoke the worlds into existence. He's, he's, he's the God that, that holds all things together and will someday loose those elements. And He's the God who became your kinsman, Redeemer. He's the God who died in your place. And in what state does Israel exist today? Unbelief. Unbelief. I believe this book is a revelation of, a testimony of Christ, a witness of Christ, primarily, first and foremost, to His people after we've been removed from the scene and, and that the picture that we see of John witnessing these things firsthand is proof that we, the body of Christ, are there with Him before the throne. We're, we are, we'll see that later on in the text. And I believe the, the doxology of Jude 1 is the last direct address to us, the body of Christ. Folks, look at it. All right, I find it very interesting. It's we see a call to persevere. Okay, and in uh, in the doxology, uh, uh, we we read uh, in, a, in the doxology, uh, we read something very. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. And we get into the book of Revelation, folks. And uh, I'm not seeing ourselves here. I'm seeing ourselves as gone. Now that may not be your view, but that's mine, and that's just for as as usual. I don't ask anyone to agree with me on anything. Well, we're we're living in uh, in a most interesting uh, phase of uh, political history here in the, in, the, in the United States. Uh, as I said at the beginning, I know I absolutely believe God has determined, past tense, the outcome of this election. I ask that you rest in Him. And until next time, let me, let, me, let me take a moment to thank you all so much for all of your continued interest in this, in this ministry and in this study. Thank you for all your comments, your love, your support. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.